Hi, my name is Hugh Patterson, and my presentation presentation today is from CV to OLAC. And this is a presentation that is part of the seventh international conference on language documentation and conservation. And uh, it's held virtually, but supported by the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The two concepts that I am juxtapositioning here are the professional presentation of the researcher or uh, person. Uh, it doesn't have to be just a researcher. And the dissemination of their efforts, that person's efforts, to a linguistic audience. So for those who might not know, OLAC is an aggregator. It was designed initially to uh, allow a user of the website to search and find by language or by a variety of uh, metadata elements, the archives of a great many language archives or a great many libraries and archives that have artifacts and records about artifacts that are important in language research. Uh, it's well embraced in the language documentation community and the record on the right of the screen looks at that it is one type of record. Uh, it's it's uh, so you can go there and you can look at these uh, things and find out, you know, oh, what are all the resources that this collection of archives knows about Hawaiian language or Japanese language or any variety of number of other languages. So looking at that, uh, at archives, then the next question is, well, what is the problem actually? Why doesn't o OLAC work or who does it work for and who does it not work for? Or why can't I find all the things that I want to find via OLAC? Well, um, there are some good reasons why language resources don't appear in OLAC. And one of those is that researchers don't always work with archives. Uh, they don't always submit their materials to archives. Um, sometimes the benefits of publishing that you uh, work with a publisher, maybe John Benjamins or De Gruyter or Langsai Press, but the materials aren't uh, from those or publishers are not aggregated in OLAC. So, um, you know, when the rewards are for centered around working with a publisher, uh, I mean, publishers could send a feed to OLAC and advertise the resources there. I think that's a great idea. I wish they would do it. Um, but it's just not, it doesn't happen right now. Um, archives don't maintain their feed, their OLAC feeds. And one thing I've noticed is that uh, in the community of people who have uh, said yes, uh, contributing to the aggregation of language resources to finding resources easily, it's often a personal decision. And when those persons who uh, agree that that's really a good thing to do, are in a position where they can influence an archive or a language artifact collection, they take the initiative to do that. Um, and the rest of us uh, benefit from that. But sometimes uh, there's technology changes and it takes a lot of work to embrace the OLAC feed from a new technology. And so that can be a challenge. Uh, and so through technological evolution or through the evolution of human resources at an organization, sometimes archives don't maintain their OLAC feeds. Uh, in general though, um, more than specific to language archives um, is a challenge with like electronic dissertations and thesis collections. So maybe you work at a, a university that has a linguistics department, but it's only one of several dozen departments or sub-organizations within the university. And so 
the library services are tasked with serving all of those uh, communities. And so they don't uh, have time or the capacity to uh, send an OLAC feed to OLAC. Uh, and so they, the curation process doesn't ask questions for fi helping find the, or the discovery of resources uh, that would be specific to a linguistics audience. They, they often take general, um, a generalist approach where the resources are uh, discoverable to a general audience and a minimal uh, curation process. Um, but, and that's a business level decision at the university level or the supporting organization. Uh, in general, though, repository software doesn't support custom metadata solutions. Like, so when I say this, I, I mean like DSpace or ePrints. Um, you can embed them in there. If you have uh, programming knowledge, you can do that. Um, uh, and software has evolved over time. And so some software stacks are easier to uh, customize. Um, but when we, but the software doesn't out of the box is what I'm saying is out of the box, it doesn't support that. General metadata librarians view OLAC as only one of many possibilities for community specific specialization options. So if I'm a metadata librarian at a university uh, and supporting the linguistics community uh, is only one of my tasks, I might have demands for my attention and metadata specialization for the STEM sciences uh, or maybe for uh, other parts of the humanities or law. Uh, and so how deeply I can engage as a metadata librarian and serving those communities is, uh, is a constraint. So this means that many times, many language resources, whether they're uh, theses, dissertations, or preprints or publications, they just don't get aggregated into OLAC uh, for a variety of reasons. But these are some of the ones that I've noticed as I've talked with librarians and as I've engaged with researchers. When I, so when it came time to look for a solution to find a way to maximize the visibility of the research that I and my wife's a linguist that she's done, um, I chose a, a solution that would also was encapsulated in the personal branding of our CVs. So a CV tells the story, the academic story that uh, of my labor, my work, and my engagement with communities and who I have had professional contacts with uh, and what the outputs of those were. So uh, I wrapped the engagement with OLAC and I see engaging and telling the world through OLAC about my work or my wife's work uh, and her CV is the one that I use in this presentation. So uh, telling them that that's an important part of my, my uh, engagement with community is, is to engage with OLAC. So um, how I did that is I took our, our website and I built it in Hugo. Now, um, Hugo is different. Um, many of my colleagues use Wix, which is a very easy to use website. I believe you pay some, you know, nine, 10 bucks a month or something for it. And uh, you can do some really professional looking things. I used WordPress for many years and I know a lot of other colleagues use WordPress. Many departments and many uh, uh, labs use WordPress as well. I know, also know many professionals use academia.edu. I find that Hugo fits my needs better than WordPress because I was able to get rid of the database. Uh, with WordPress, 
uh, self-hosted. You also had to have a database and a website. And I didn't want to deal with how many plugins I needed to update all the time uh, and security features. Hugo processes markdown files, which are plain text files, into HTML files. So academia.edu, uh, I have had some challenges with that. Uh, I cannot find things as easily. I use Google to search academia.edu. So uh, I find that academia.edu inhibits me from finding the things I'm looking for unless I'm a paying customer. So I would rather uh, you, people spend their time looking at my works. So I chose to self-host. I use a theme on top of Hugo called Wow Kimmy. And Wow Kimmy is especially designed for academics who want to produce a portfolio of their work, which is the same concept as a CV. This is what my wife's, uh, some pages from my wife's website look like. I use a very basic, uh, like this is basically what the Wow Kimmy looks like. I've done some different things with the fonts. I've done some different things with the colors. Uh, so uh, I've also done some things in the, uh, with the, uh, let's see, the, the custom taxonomies. You see that in the, the bottom most picture where citable as, um, and uh, what we see there in the custom taxonomies is, you know, tags, subject languages, countries, cities, content mediums, and organizations. So if you're browsing the CV, it's not just a CV, but it's also an engagement with the work and the objects of work that uh, this person did. And so if you want to look at all of the languages that they, they, um, have studied or have written about. Um, I made that a important part of the browsing experience. Uh, and, and so I wanted then Google to find out about these things. So I built Google Scholar metadata to go into the CV as well. And um, that's built on Dublin Core. Now, OLAC is also built on Dublin Core. So since I had already done that work, um, the, the, the specific values that go in here, you can see a value, so a DC title, and then there's the title you see it after in content. So the values are already in my header files. So Markdown file in Hugo or in Jekyll has a section at the top that's just metadata, and then it has the content. Um, and so in my, the picture on the right is a excerpt from uh, some of my uh, metadata in my, the header of one of my files. Um, and so the syntax that I use is a syntax language called uh, YAML. And so uh, the, you can see there that OLAC roles and OLAC linguistic subject and OLAC linguistic data type are, are right there. And basically, OLAC has five specific metadata elements. They have the language code, which is an ISO 639-3 code. They have the OLAC roles, and then they have the, the OLAC linguistic subject, and they have OLAC linguistic data type. And then they also have um, a discourse genre. So uh, taking care of those things uh, and putting them into the metadata header for each object that uh, is in the CV, um, then I was able to basically use this following workflow where we have custom metadata in the markdown documents. It's custom in the sense that uh, it's non-standard from Hugo or non-standard from Wow Kimmy, but I created a template and I follow that template. And so it's standard within my context. And because my template is based off of the OLAC requirements and the Dublin Core requirements, then I can use those both for search engine optimization, but also with communicating with the scholarly community or the language, the community that's interested in language resources. Um, so then I created a custom uh, Hugo RSS template. So this is basically a template that says, create a special RSS feed using particular 
elements from my metadata in my the header of my documents, then I use the standard Hugo deploy um, workflow. I, it generates all the HTML on my computer, and then I push it out to GitHub, and I host on GitHub. It's free. Uh, then um, in this particular case, I, Hugo generated the OLAC compliant, OAI compliant feed. And I went to the OLAC website, told it where that feed was on the internet and that it could fetch it. And it validated the feed. It didn't validate it in the first time, but eventually I got there. And then OLAC inclusion uh, is still pending. Uh, there's Gary Simons and Stephen Bird are the uh, current OLAC um, review board. And uh, it's been about 24 hours. And I understand both of those uh, gentlemen are busy at the moment. But uh, maybe by the time this conference uh, happens in two weeks, maybe it'll be included in the OLAC website at that time. So still pending. So what does my code look like? So I mentioned uh, YAML before, um, but some, every Hugo, every Hugo uh, website has a config file. And if you use a theme, they might have some special configuration for that theme. So I added to that config Config file and the config file is written in a, in a data markup language called Tamil, which is really simple. So basically, in this picture here, I created an output format .rss with a base name of OAI. You can see that in the bottom, and that's my custom OSS feed, uh, RSS feed. Uh, then I created another config file with all of the required metadata for describing the archive. And uh, this will generate the data that's supposed to go into the OAI feed and the OAI section of the OLAC feed. So the OLAC feed has two parts. It has actually three parts. It has the part that describes the archive and some of that is required by the OAI uh, protocol, and part of it is required by the, uh, the OLAC protocol. And so there, that's the, the major two parts. And then you have the part that's all your records. Um, and so to generate the records, I used an, this RSS template. And then I put my Hugo uh, code in there. Uh, you can see the white squir squiggly br uh, braces. Um, that's basically calling the uh, OAI um, uh, values from the previous slide. Um, but the same values then, uh, I, I used a, a template to pull, to iterate through all of my um, special, not special, they're just uh, the, the pages that represent the publications and the talks and uh, the different uh, components of the, the CV. So uh, it iterates through each of those and then presents those. And at the end, I have uh, an OAI OLAC compliant feed that's on the web. And you can see that then on the left, that's how you view it in the browser. And on the right is how the XML looks like in my coding tool. So that's how the, that's the, the presentation. Um, but uh, if you are interested in this uh, sort of thing, um, I encourage you to uh, look, check out Hugo and check out Wildcami. Um, there's a great, uh, community, uh, a very supportive community. My understanding, again, is that there's uh, around 500,000 downloads of Wild Kimmy, and so it's lots, it's seen lots and lots of use, uh, and it doesn't require a database. And so uh, I, if you want to collaborate or want more information, I encourage you to talk to me, 
and say thank you and mahalo.